Hello, Hunter. I'm good. I'm good. Can't complain. Always excited to be back and welcomed here. <laughs> I love the platform. I love everything Power to Fly does. Oh, well, we adore you too. And I'm loving this background. This is so good. Oh, let me tell you, I chose this background um, hesitantly because I wasn't sure if I was able to since I am going to be, but I know United Health Group is also a partner with um, with Power to Fly. And this is actually was made by an artist, with, I believe within the company. I'm not too sure how they did it, but I believe it's within the company. And I've seen this and this has just been my favorite. They have shirts, totes, like everything just to, you know, celebrate this month. It's one of the many things they've done. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So beautiful. I love that. I love that. I love that. Well, for folks that are just uh, maybe getting to know you for the first time here on this chat, I, they're in for a treat. Can you um, give them a little bit of, a, of insight of who you are, where you come from, and, and what you do? Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm a jack slash Jill of all trades, but <laughs> I, I definitely focus on, um, you know, I like the factor of the description, put DEI thought leader. You know, I always think about it every time I see that, but um, I currently work at United Health Group as um, a, a patient navigator, which I do work in uh, low income marginalized communities within particular states. But um, uh, within, that, within that job description, I also am very heavily involved with DEI. So a lot of diversity, equity, inclusion, a lot of public speaking, a lot of creating content, materials, um, speaking at different places, getting involved with different organizations, just making sure the work is out there. Um, my main goal really is inclusive, inclusivity and representation, just to make sure. Diversity is definitely going to be there because sometimes I think we focus too much on the visual diversity and not so, not so much on the others. So I definitely try to do my best to bring awareness to all of it. I love that. Yeah, the the invisible diversity is such a key element that is often overlooked because it requires both from everyone, like more from everyone, right? To make that part of the conversation, to be forthcoming about that. If it's something, you know, like I am, I also, oh, related, I got a new term from this. I love these summits because I always learn things. And uh Name checking Tyler for the second time today, uh, Tyler um, Blackburn, wonderful. And I was talking about like being neurodivergent and da 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 da. And he used this term neuro expansive, and I was like, oh yes, that's a good one. I I hadn't heard that before, but like something like that, that's you know that requires me to talk about it because how would anyone know otherwise? Exactly. And I think that's the main key here. Like I said, besides just focusing on visual, you know, what about those that don't maybe not feel comfortable enough to talk about their invisible diversity and our things of that nature. And the overall goal is just to make sure you create a safe space for everyone. Yeah. So what are some uh, key principles that have guided your leadership, Joshua's leadership journey within the LGBTQIA plus community? And how have those those guides, those, those, those benchmarks for you, how have they helped you advocate for the rights and representation of our alphabet family here? <laughs> I, I, you know, it's funny, I always say the alphabet mafia, but- uh... Yeah, Meg uses- <laughs> Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. yeah cause I'm like, it keeps growing, but, um, and I have no problem with that cause all is welcome. But um, a few things for me that stands out is definitely empowerment, support, being authentic in every environment that I'd step into, which didn't come overnight. It was definitely a process <laughs> and still ongoing and working. You know, it's really, you have to observe to make sure you're in a safe space before you actually, you know, putting yourself out there. Um, another thing is, is awareness, collaboration, and um, education. Um, I definitely try to stay up on times um, to make sure that I am up to date about everything that's going on, you know, worldwide and in the community wise, as well as everything. But overall, I think what truly helped my leadership is um, meeting others that, um, that are, have similar values or meeting others that um, were willing to help me grow and, you know, partners, you know, plant a seed and say, you know, this is what you need to do and just really observe it. You know, humility goes a long way and observing, I've picked up a lot and added my own to it. Oh, I love that. And what is, you, you mentioned authenticity. What does authenticity mean to you? 
Authenticity is um, actually one of the probably most important things uh, about advocacy and just um, this whole field, I should say, because first, if you think about it, I, you know, one of my first and foremost advocacy is, of course, the community, but it's also in the workplace. We, if you think about it, we spend eight hours a day at work, right? It's the majority of the day, if you think about it. And um, if you can't bring your whole self and bring, bring your spirituality or um, just everything with you, to work, it's almost like, you know, you're leaving part of yourself outside. You can't just always be professional and leave out the, the sense of humor, the giddy, the, you know, the campy, all this other stuff, but, you know, because it's not who you are. So it's just really just really just being, bringing your full self to work or bringing your full self to any environment you step into without having to be, without being uncomfortable. Yeah, 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 totally. Um, and what is, what is important to you in, in leadership? Um, for me in leadership, um, which I'm learning as I continue to be under different leaders, uh, it's always a growing process first and foremost. But I think some things that stand out for me for, in leadership is patience, mm. humility, understanding, and also honesty. Um, I think that's sort of like the, the main things I really look for. And I look for that by posing particular questions that I know that to see how people react to them, to see what type of response I get to them. It's almost like poking the bear, kind of. You're just testing the waters there, trying to see what's, what response are you getting? Like, what, what's going to happen here? So um, I really just, those, those qualities are important to me. And if I don't see those qualities, it doesn't mean that um, I ignore the leadership or things of that nature. It just means we have to have a conversation. And it just means that either we need to work together in figuring something out or figure out what next steps are. Mm, I love that. Yeah, I love that. And how would you ensure visibility and, and representation in, in your company or, or in your org? You know, that's a, a great question. I've been trying to think of that. And um, <laughs> when I, when I, as I was reviewing them and it's, you know, it's not as easy as most people think. Um, mm -hmm. You know, because if you if you think about it, it's qualifications, experience, things of that nature. But I think the best way to answer this would be is um, is make sure you have a mentor program. Make sure that um, your whoever's in charge of your upper leadership, whether it's CEO, corporate things of that nature, make sure they're you know re revising their senior leadership and supervisors and everybody underneath that factor to make sure. That, and I'm not saying go out and fire everybody because everyone's a particular area. That's not what I'm saying, but I'm saying like, hey, if you notice that things look the same or you have the same of one, one um, gender or one race or one ethnicity, whatever the case may be, then how about you just add to them by additional training by um, saying, hey, I see this is, a, this is a call out that we're doing. There's nothing wrong with it in some places because I'm sure you have other things that make you different from one another. But at this point, let's start a mentor program. Let's start a program where you pick up somebody that is different from you, different gender than you, different upbringing, different culture than you so that you guys are able, to, so everyone's able to come together and learn from each other. And, you know, with, which it doesn't ensure representation, but it does help bring it along and it can help possibly expand across the, any company organization. Mm, yeah, that's that's so important. And are there certain steps that, you know, because like you said, it's very complex. Are there steps to that you would suggest that uh, help create safe spaces for folks? Um, absolutely. Um, I think one of the one of the first steps I definitely would say would be is is listening. Um, I will actually rewind, it'll be showing up, showing up and then listening. Um, and then showing up just can be in many different forms, whether you're, whether the person or the place or environment, because it depends on where you're at, of course. And I always make sure that's clear because we step into tons of different environments daily and we never know if it's an actual safe space or not. But to create a safe space, it's definitely keen around, you know, your body language, your facial expressions, your tone, um, really how engaging you are with the individual and really showing that you have empathy, you care, you're willing to learn, you're willing to put down your own biases, your own privilege, things of that nature, then pick up like, hey, let's let's do this together and walk alongside each other. And I think that's the best way to open a door to anybody for that matter, to walk in and say, yeah, you know, I feel safe here. You know, it's, it's for me personally, it's usually about the tone. 
if um, and that's kind of really gives me, it gives people away. That, that's for me personally, though, for someone else, it may be something else. It might be body language. It might be facial expressions that will just shut somebody down. But it doesn't mean just because they notice that it doesn't mean that it's not still a safe space. It just means that's probably how the person is and they're not aware of it. And you just got to help them with it. <laughs> how, you, how do you help them with it? How do you provide that feedback? So the best way to provide feedback, um, I always, you know, I've always said, regardless throughout this, <laughs> these summits, is feedback is a gift. And um, if you're open to feedback, the first thing is ask them, like, hey, I appreciate you inviting me here. I appreciate being in this space, but are you open to feedback? Or am I willing to share some feedback with you? And if the person says no, honestly, then you just would have to respect their decision. I've never came across someone that said no, but I mean, I'm sure there's people out there, you know, it could depend on the situation. But most likely when you're asking that, they're, they're, well, most people will say yes. Now, if you just spit it out and say, oh, well, X, Y, and Z, you're more or less to create kind of a confrontation there and can turn a little left, foot, left field, if I must say. Yeah, yeah, totally. Because it, it, it might depend on like if you are equals and level or if like maybe they're a superior or vice versa like right. there's also something to navigate there when there are that those 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 um elements at play yeah i mean and even if i, I always sit there and say even if they are your boss or they're an upper level than you it's okay to still ask the question but again it's really it's really be be ready for the response i guess and, and that's that preparation takes personal preparation to say hey if they ask if they say no and they're your boss what more can you possibly do you know if if you're outside of work and it's a different type of situation and they're still higher or whatever it's really just about be ready if they say yes or no most people are probably shocked when people say yes and they're like oh wait i wasn't expecting that and then they go into well this is my feedback for you when you when i'm sharing with you this is the facial expression i get which makes me uncomfortable because it makes me feel that you do x y and z or um, your body language, um, or your tone, your tone's a little bit aggressive, your tone's a little surprised, you know, just sharing stuff like that to make people aware um, of their surroundings and of themselves can help really bring along, bring someone along to, to more. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No, that's fantastic. Can you talk about um, the collaboration uh, or the aspects for factors for leaders. So is, is collaboration and allyship, how does that impact leadership skills? Honestly, I think, um, I think those two things are actually required in leadership. Um, you know, if you're in leadership and you're doing everything on your own, um, you're not a leader. You just have a position and a title. Um, true leadership um, depends on collaboration because if you don't understand something or if it's outside your scope, what are you going to do? Um, Google doesn't have all the answers. And if they do, I'm sure, I don't know how, how half of them are right. So, you know, so it's best to partner with somebody, whether it's from the community, whether it's from a different department, whether it's from a different culture, different spiritual level, whatever, whatever the research is, school, you know, you definitely want to make sure that you reach out and you ask or extend for that assistance because um, that collaboration can definitely be a learning opportunity as well. And I, and I always look for learning opportunities. Go figure, I never liked school growing up, but I always love learning opportunities now that I'm older. And mm -hmm. I believe, you know, for a leader to be an ally, um, most people's like, yeah, let me throw a rainbow on or let me throw a flag on my desk. And that's definitely showing as ally. I'm like, yeah, that's, that's, that's great. You know, it's, it's cool you want to go that far, but hey, how about speaking about a meeting or how about create an event or how about donate into a particular cause that may help a homeless youth or something like that? Or how about going out and volunteering at particular organizations to really just step up that allyship to make it more actionable? And if you're not able to be actual or help financially, hell, the, the next thing you can do is definitely um, research, research and read and just learn on your own. Um, LinkedIn Learning is a great place. I think I've said in the past, I live on that. <laughs> so um, there's a lot of great topics to cover there that really helps and defines inclusive leadership, collaborative leadership, and all these different type of leadership styles. Yeah, I love that. Talk, talk to me more about inclusive leadership. What does that look like? Inclusive leadership is one of the um, one of the main topics I focus on personally when I uh, when I'm speaking or training, and that looks more or less of really being open to the room, open to the people in the room, 
uh, you know, a lot of people when they are presenting or a lot of people when they're, um, you know, you know, yeah, presenting at a meeting or such, you know, they'll take control of it. But open that, open in that, uh, open that door for dialogue, open that door for questions, open that door for feedback, open that door. Inclusive is just inviting everybody to the table and also giving them a voice and a chance to be heard. And by doing that, you stay humble. By doing that, you, you progress a lot more. And it's also just it's a good thing to do. <laughs> I mean, you know, giving people a voice to be heard is one of the main things that most people or individuals are looking for is just want to be heard. Yes. Oh my God. Heard and seen, right? That's one, that's one of our, that's one of our main arguments is like, Hey, yeah, we exist and we're not going nowhere. <laughs> right, 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 right. So you've been a, a, a leader in, I'm sorry if you can hear my dog barking there, um, a creative leader with experience in various sectors how do you adapt your leadership style when working with different organizations from nonprofits and tech companies? You know, that's a great question. And it's not easy because, um, you know, you I have the nonprofit sector. I have the, the spiritual sector, tech company, healthcare. So it's really just um, making your making your skill and your style transferable. Um, and by making it all, making it transferable, meaning is that it's just not a job, it's who you are. So it goes back to that original, it goes back to our original, which is authenticity. If you are a natural born leader, or you're natural born in, look for like being inclusive or diverse or just naturally like people, regardless of their skin color or what they do or how they look, then, I mean, you're going to be successful regardless. Um, for me, it was definitely a learning curve to... <laughs> to learn how to transfer from, let's say, a spiritual aspect, a church environment to the tech company or a nonprofit. To, but at the one thing that I realized is that once you grasp that people are just willing to learn and you treat them as people, they're willing to be open-minded and just receive. Mm, yeah. Yeah, I love that. With your um, background in, in, in health and in health education, how has it influenced your approach to the LGBTQIA plus uh, in your approach to leadership and advocacy with them, with this group, us? <laughs> um, you know, actually, I, you know, as I continue to go on, cause I was out of the healthcare for a while and cause I took that time to be in a tech industry to learn what that, what that really was. So now that I'm back in healthcare, it's kind of eye opening to really see let me see. <laughs> to say this, but, um, it's it's eye opening to see how much of a struggle it really is in the healthcare industry around DEI. Like, there's a lot of companies, a lot of hospitals, a lot of doctors. They're trying. They're trying to grasp it. They're trying to get draw straws. And I think the best thing that I can do is continuously stay on top of again, being staying up to date, so that I can be an advocate. So I can be a voice because I don't want to be sitting out there spewing out out of out of date information and not know what's going on but no right now you know i definitely follow a lot of the, a lot of health <laughs> health you know health equity columns um or, or profiles or things of that nature just continuously reading them articles to see what that's about and i try to utilize that knowledge and i share it amongst my team at work i share it with people at my organization that i volunteer for so it's just really just being a, it's, it's pausing for a second so that they can be heard, but also given that it goes back to that platform of giving them a voice. And by giving them a voice, you're just opening the door for them to grow and be their own leaders. Mm. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Giving them the voice to be their own leaders. I love that. <laughs> love that. So you've, you've also mentioned that you work in, in faith-based organizations. How has that affected your perspective on inclusivity and allyship? Great question. And um, honestly, for a while, it was very daunting. For a while, it um, plagued me because I didn't understand that um, it's supposed to be considered a safe haven or um, a place of healing, a place of love and a place of, you know, all these positive words I heard growing up. And as I got older, you know, I had to step away for a period of time to really find out if that's what I really wanted to be involved in, because there wasn't a lot of diversity, depending on, you know, what de denomination or where you go, there wasn't a lot of diversity, there wasn't a lot of inclusion. And especially, you know, now more than ever, you know, I definitely 
I think what I do is I help people. So people, some people think that I, I got, I went that way just so I have ammunition. And for me personally, this is what I do. And I believe as a believer personally, because for me, it's common Susan and absolutely love. And I want to take that and make sure that my community feels that because, um, me, you know, I've lost people to, you know, suicide, unfortunately, heard home. I came across a lot of the individuals that um, are healing. You know, I have a friend who actually opened up um, a, an organization regarding around religious trauma and helping, pe helping our community heal through that because they dealt with so much. And the way that, um, that helped me navigate it is just being honest. And just saying, this is who I am. And this is, you can throw whatever you want at me, but this is what the dialect says. This is the transfers. Like I go, I go way back to the point where like the original translation type, and I'm like, I have to continue reminding. So I'm just constantly reviewing that as well. And it's a constant struggle because a lot of stuff that, you know, you see online nowadays goes against what I'm trying to really show and help individuals see. And loving and inclusivity is my biggest preach when it comes to spirituality. And it doesn't have to look like in the building. And I have to remind people, you don't need to be in a building to believe you can be anywhere you want. And it's still your belief and it's what you want it to be. Yeah. Yeah. There's this growing up, like you spoke to the religious trauma of being told what is and isn't spirituality as opposed to giving ourselves the space to finding out what that is for us as individuals, as queer individuals in particular. Right. And we don't, we don't get that space because again, if you're brought up that way, this is what it is. But then as you grow, you get that freedom to explore. You get that freedom to just say, is this really for me? Is this what I really believe? Or do I believe this plus other spiritual practices? Or do I believe this plus let's say meditation or, so, you know, all this other stuff. I mean, there's, it's, it's endless. And that's why, I, and that's why I get so excited sometimes because it is endless when it comes to there. It's more than just prayer, worship, reading. It's more than just attending a building and being, you know, it's, it's so much more. And I think that's my main goal when it comes to that particular topic is I want to make sure I want to help people realize, especially within our community, that they're welcomed, they're loved, and they're accepted for who they are and they don't have to change. Yes, 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 yes. Can you speak to any initiatives, programs, boards that you're on that um, are you feel have really helped you give back and things that um, you might point other people towards? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm currently in California, so if you're in California, great. <laughs> Um, but um, growing up, I'm not a grown up, I'm sorry, when I was back in New York, um, I have tons of agencies, you know, I work with GMHC who helped cultivate and when first started my, um, started my journey and volunteer in the HIV marginalized community. Um, then I went from, you know, village care, went to gay men's African descent and just kept going from there. And, and then it kept growing. My love for the community just kept growing. And I'm like, like I can't sit in the back burner. I want to be involved. I want to get my hands dirty. I want to know what it's like to just help and see people succeed and be successful. So now what I do is um, besides my own, I sit on the board of an uh, organization called the Rainbow, a Contra Costa Rainbow Center here locally. And uh, it, was, it was recent. I, I followed them for a period of time just to see if it's something I really wanted to do. But after considering their mission and realizing that their main goal is to make sure, well, one of their one of their goals is to help LGBT homeless youth that's been displaced, that has been, you know, either kicked out, have nowhere to go, lost their job, whatever the case is, and they're, at, you know, which is one which is near and dear to me for personal reasons as well. But also um, another aspect is, is they de they deal a lot with the HIV community. They deal a lot with several different communities. They have a great pro youth program for trans and non-binary individuals. You know, they have a school program, a training program. They, they have just so many great programs that is needed in this community. And, you know, right now, one of my individual goals is to really help build that up, build more relationships within the within my area, within the school, within PFLAG, with just being able to get out there and help get a message out there, especially um, one of the events I went to was very heartbreaking because I saw I got to hear a lot of the students speak um, about their experiences in school and what they go through on a daily basis and, you know, the bullying and the, the names. And, you know, I'm just, 
like I understand at one point it was like that with growing up when I was in school, but to hear this going on and how bad it's gotten for these individuals, I just, my heart broke for them and it just made me yearn that much more to see what I can create to help protect them and give them a safe space. Mm, mm. Yeah, that's, it is heartbreaking, but it is so important to be awake to the realities, right? And how we can contribute and how we can help. So we only have a couple of minutes left. Is there anything that you would, that we haven't touched on that you wanna make sure that we touch on in these last few minutes or uh, anything that we can, um, you can point us towards things that you're up to? Yeah, absolutely. So currently I'm, I'm on LinkedIn, um, it's under my name. Uh, it's on, I only have Joshua here, but it is under my name. Um, it's on my profile. Also, um, I've been more engaged lately, and I actually uh, have a newsletter on there called The More You Know, and it does cover a lot of LGBT issues, um, social justice, uh, leadership tips, things of that nature that feel free to follow, feel free to add. Um, and yeah, it's pretty much about it. Besides being heavily involved with uh, Rainbow Center right now, um, I'm actually tabling a Pride event this weekend for them. Um, at, I just keep busy with them, but the main thing on a side note is um, always available to help, you know, ERGs, companies, things of that nature, bring up open eyes, I guess, let's say that. <laughs> and for folks that are looking to maybe get more involved with an ERG or start one at their business, what would be an actionable thing you would give them to do today? Absolutely. Um, the first thing, because I, you know, I've experienced this, is find an ally or um, a leader that you know that is really invested. That you notice they go out their way to make change within the company. That may not be your original leader, but definitely, definitely would say come up with a proposal on what you think the ERG should be, which is Employee Resource Group. Is that definitely whether it is an LGBT one, whether it's a Black Excellence one, regardless of what it's for, you know, definitely have it planned on what, it, what you want it to cover, what you want it to look like, things of that nature, so that, you know, they, they can start building the plan for it. And then have that, you and that leader go to the higher leaders to really present and help them to see what next steps are. Mm, mm, I love that. Well, Joshua, it's always a pleasure to chat with you, to see you. Thank you so much for uh, today. And Thanks. I look forward to the next time. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. You have a good one. You too.